lieutenant in the Royal Australian Navy. I joined in 1996 as a uh, recruit radio operator. I uh, worked in intelligence. I uh, qualified as an intelligence officer um, at Dinsey down at uh, Canungra. I um, performed a number of uh, tasks that I can't really discuss due to the Crimes Act um, that causes a lot of problems because I can't even disclose things um, with psychiatrists and psychologists that are treating me so it makes it very difficult to uh, deal with particular issues. Life as a seaman officer and a seaman officer trainee is tough. There's no, no two ways around it and your superiors can be pretty hard on you and that's normal, you would expect that. You would expect them to raise their voice when they're not happy with you, all that sort of, that's fine, there's no issue with that. But um, when I was on, uh, on board submarine, I was uh, sexually abused as part of a, um, an induction ritual, I suppose you would call it. Um, I wouldn't call it hazing, but um, you know, I attempted to report it to my superiors and my superiors told me directly that it was, I was to put up with it and to shut up. It was part of being an officer in submarines. That's it, you put up with it. And it was fairly dramatic is probably the best way to describe it. Um, further on from that, um, when I was aboard uh, a particular vessel, uh, I was uh, doing a set of officer of the watch manoeuvres and uh, the particular commanding officer wasn't happy with my conduct and struck me on the back of the head with a roller ruler which weighs about three kilos and it's made of solid brass. Um, I received seven stitches for that effort and my jaw is out of alignment because of it. I served until 2007. I saw active service in East Timor um, during the United Nations peacekeeping effort in uh, 2000 and I saw service in the Middle East as part of Operation Slipper. I did receive payment for um, speaking um, Arabic and Persian or Farsi, the language it's called, uh, whilst I was in the Persian Gulf. This stemmed from um, it was on my personal file that I could speak Arabic. I learnt Tetum when I was in East Timor and both in East Timor and in the Persian Gulf I uh, performed duties ashore as well as at sea which is unusual for a naval officer. Um, as a seaman officer my primary role is on the bridge of a warship. However because I was the only one in the task group at the time that was qualified in that I was fluent and that I taught myself Persian in six weeks, I was required to do other things ashore. Um, and also I was required to speak to foreign captains of uh, Iranian and Arabic vessels. I was also required to issue official warnings in Arabic and Persian that we were going to engage those vessels. On one particular occasion, I was the only one that could speak Arabic and we were about to engage an unarmed civilian vessel. Were you actually tr uh, trained in the combat areas of those as well? Or were you just... Only as far as the naval combat skill set would go. Anything ashore, no, I was not officially trained in any of that sort of um, conduct. Witnessed active service for sure, yes. And you can't talk about that? No. Can't talk about it due to the Crimes Act restrictions. And that combat was providing linguistic support for um, certain elements. Um, I would not be able to discuss any of what's really affecting me until I was afforded the appropriate opportunity, one, with a credentialed psychological um, medical officer that has the appropriate security clearance and also secondarily before the appropriate level of uh, public scrutiny that afforded me the legal protections uh, to be able to, to tell the story effectively. So effectively you're probably going to need to have a, um, either a send inquiry or a royal commission so there's men like you or men and women like you that can come out and actually speak of their experience and get this out on the table so we can get you some help or the help that you need. That's right and the primary issue here is that I'm not the only one. 
No, um, there will probably be, I would say by now, many hundreds of people that are in this operational security uh, bind where they simply can't talk about their experiences, they can't get them off their chest and I'm in the same boat. So yes, that's right, we'd need that avenue. Yes, I've got three children and I'm married and I'm pretty lucky to still be living in that situation. My wife has gone through hell and so have my kids. It's affected my kids dramatically. I have attempted suicide on a number of occasions and the simple reason is that I have felt that um, they would be, my family would be better off without me. They would be financially uh, better off. On one occasion I even went to the trouble of contacting the department and finding out what the entitlements would be upon my death. So um, I have systematically abused medication over a long period of time because I haven't been able to deal with with problems. I have, as I say, attempted suicide, self-harm, that sort of thing. Spent a lot of time in various um, psychological uh, wards, that kind of thing. Since 2007 when you received a medical discharge, has your treatment been under Veterans Affairs? Okay, it's been a long road with DVA. Uh, I initially did my DVA claim uh, before I was uh, medically discharged, I started about eight months before and I'd submitted it about a month before I was discharged. Now I was discharged with a white card and under the usual uh, Merca discharge conditions. That all was fine but it took, I, I realised the white card was nigh on useless and it took about two years with the assistance of um, someone from the Vietnam Veterans Association to get me the gold card, to get me a VEA, sort of a small VEA pension. But the situation now is that I have three separate income streams and I'm consistently having to leap through administrative hoops, medical hoops all of the time as part of the Merca INCAP regulations and the MSBS regulations. I have to have constant medical reviews and this really exacerbates my psychological condition because I am constantly paranoid of what DVA is going to do and they, DVA would contact me probably on a fortnightly, maybe a monthly basis with seemingly unusual questions that unfortunately because my mind's the way it is, I'm wondering what are they up to. My main problem has really come up when I've applied for TPI and this alone clause. So effectively because I have three separate claims under three separate areas of legislation that prohibits me because of the alone and in, it, in of itself clause in the VA, I can't have a TPI. Yet I can't work, I can't study, I'm lucky if I sleep four hours a night, I don't do anything through the day. It's this constant problem and I had hoped that TPI would solve it, solve it, but that's not the case. It's actually aggravated. Uh, what message do you have for the Prime Minister and the Veterans Affairs Minister, Michael Wilson? We served in good faith. We, without question, on every occasion deployed, whether we agreed with it or not, we followed orders. We did exactly what we were told to in arduous, difficult conditions that were very, very dangerous and very mentally taxing, often without complaint. So my message is quite simple. The obligation is on you to look, or not on you specifically, but is on the department to look after those who've served this country without question or delay. So the service needs to be reciprocated from DVA and from the department. You need to look after us. In my, can, in my case specifically, I think the remedy or the appropriate remedy would be being granted a TPI pension so that I can be left alone to at least try and get on with my life.